from the high summer, the advance in the south halted and the Somme became a battle of grisly attrition. The Germans in High Wood held out through the rest of July and into August, despite waves of attacks and the full fury of the British guns. In mid-August, frustrated at the feeble British advance, General Haig ordered a string of linked attacks to break through the rear of High Wood, out of Delville Wood, and to capture the bastion village of Guillemont. By now, the British way of war was to reduce the landscape and everything in it to ruination. Guillemont itself was erased from the earth. But still, the Germans held on. They were supremely self-critical. If anything went wrong that allowed the British to break into their lines, they wanted to know why and to rectify that straight away in order to defend the bastion which they created here on the Western Front. The horrors the German army endured at Guillemont were captured by Lieutenant Ernst Junger in his memoir, Storm of Steel. The ground all round as far as the eye could see, was ploughed by shells. You could search in vain for one wretched blade of grass. This churned up battlefield was ghastly. Among the living lay the dead. As we dug ourselves in, we found them in layers, stacked one upon the top of another. Junga was a young man who wanted to fight. He wanted to go into battle. He wanted to experience battle. His nerves, his entire body. He wanted to get a sense of the experience of the trenches and the excitement of the camaraderie. But it's a battle of large forces and, and large armies and masses of people that never encounter each other. And he feels cheated. He feels that this isn't the war he was going to fight. He wanted to fight. The journey to Guillemont was a terrifying trudge through a featureless landscape. Junger and his men had to follow a white tape as all distinguishing landmarks, even the road itself, had been obliterated. The only shelter was a few sunken lanes. This one would be their ultimate destination. Here Junger and the 73rd Hanoverian Fusiliers found their own corner of hell. They entered one sunken lane like this. It was full of corpses. They moved on further. They entered another sunken lane. That too was full of corpses. They left that and every shell hole was full of German dead. And then they dropped into this lane here. And Junger says that upon his arrival with the 73rd Hanoverians, the men who were here, their voices trembled with joy when they heard that they were going to be relieved. As the first streaks of dawn appeared in the sky, he plucked up enough courage to have a look over the top. To the rear, he saw a carpet of German dead. To the front here, towards Trone Wood, it was a carpet of British dead. He knows that this is going to be a battle of epic dimensions. He knows that this is a battle of a magnitude and never seen before. He, he thinks, he's convinced that he's going to die. The Germans had been occupying Guillemont and its farms for two years, and preparations long in place allowed them to hold on here. This is how the Germans in Guillemont managed to escape Junger's, what he called the storm of steel, the high explosive, the avalanche of high explosive, which totally destroyed the village above. These steps lead down probably another two or three meters below my feet here into possibly a labyrinth to house hundreds of men, possibly even thousands of men, connected to other cellars of houses in the village. The deep dugouts of Guillemont had originally been miles behind the front line. And with defenses such as these, the Germans slowed the British advance on the Somme to a crawl. The British had no alternative but to keep up the storm of steel, pulverizing ground already destroyed. This is the result of just what, a few meters walk, 10 meters walk through this field into no man's land. This is a 
shell splinters here, fragments of bullet, a bit of copper from driving bands of shells. A large shell splinter, imagine that flying through the air, red hot. Younger describes something like that hitting him on the belt, but it lost all its velocity by the time it did it. It would have torn him in half if it, it would have been travelling at full speed. Really what it was here was industrial mutual annihilation. That's what we're looking at at Guillemot. And it's strange looking around the landscape now because it is so benign and so productive and so beautiful. It has a wonderful light, the Somme area. And yet at the same time, you know what has taken place here. In Storm of Steel, Guillemot stands as the harbinger of a new kind of warfare in which the individual disappeared, replaced by huge, faceless armies fighting in a man-made wilderness. It's a situation in which ideologies disappear and nations disappear. Everything is just coming together in this huge amount of energy. It's not a class war, it's not a war of nations for him, it's a war in which energy is mobilized and everyone becomes part of it, regardless of where they stand. The war for him is the same, he says, as it is for people on the other side. It's one war, it's one huge mobilization that takes hold of everyone. For a period after the war, this idea of marshalling citizens, industry and economy to a single purpose would obsess Junger. He would rewrite Storm of Steel a number of times until it became an acknowledged classic. But in the 1920s, it was taken up by German veterans and by the fledgling Nazi party. Chivalry here took a final farewell. It had to yield to the heightened intensity of war, just as all fine and personal feeling has to yield when machinery gets the upper hand. The Europe of today appeared here for the first time in battle. Junger was injured and in hospital when Guillermont finally fell on September the 3rd. Almost to a man, his comrades disappeared, vanishing, as he writes, without trace in the fiery labyrinths of the battle. 